So it is with great pleasure that, and, and really I feel like it's a little bit of a welcome home to, to Deborah Majoris. Please give me a round of applause that Deb is here. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, I think for those of you that know, Deb has had one of those careers that um, folks could only dream of, I think, in a lot of ways, who have these ambitions uh, to have been the chief legal officer of Procter & Gamble for 14 years. Uh, prior to that, chair of the Federal Trade Commission, deputy assistant attorney general at the Department of Justice, and a partner at Jones Day. Uh, and lots of other things in between in terms of board service, uh, mentoring, all kinds of things that Deb has done. So we're so grateful to have her here to talk to us about everything. <laughs> so we're going to run through sort of a set of questions, that's okay? Yep. Um, and then open it up to questions. So this is really your time to think about what you would like to ask someone who's been in a, a, a company like Procter & Gamble, and I, 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 I ask you all to go to your hotel rooms and look in your toilet kits, and I think you will, it'll shock you to see how many of those products, I, I just did it. I'm like, oh my God, that too. Uh, Procter & Gamble is an amazing global company. Deb oversaw over 500 employees uh, for 14 years, and so we are so lucky to have you here. So, I'll, I'll stop talking. <laughs> I promise. And what we thought we'd start out, um, Debbie, is just talk to us about kind of the narrative of your career, maybe some of the highs, maybe some of the not so highs. Give us a sense of that. Well, first of all, thanks. It's great, uh, great to be back with the ABA and great to see uh, all of you. Um, I just retired from Procter and Gamble last Friday, so uh, so. <laughs> So, so people are like, are you going on safari? Are you going to Italy? Are you... No, I'm going to Bozeman to hang with my peeps. <laughs> so, uh, so, um, so no, it's great. Thank you, Shara, so much uh, for that introduction. Um, you know, it's funny. I, I always say that when you, um, if you look at people's resumes and you try to put them on a graph, um, maybe our economist friends could put them on a graph, you know, it would go like this, right? But as all of you know, I think by now it's not that it's like this, um, and uh, and such is you know definitely the case with me. And there's sort of two ways I think about the highs and the lows. There's um, sort of the stuff you're working on, um, which um, it's good if you don't take it personally. I think I've learned that over time. And then there's your own career and kind of the highs and lows and how you feel about that. And the two are obviously intermingled. Um, but, um, but there isn't any question, it's going to sound really, really cliche, but when I think about some of the low points, um, there's just no doubt in my mind there are the points of the greatest learning. I mean, um, uh, you look back, it's easy to say that now, of course, uh, you might be miserable at the time, but, um, but there's no question, and you're, you are who you are now because of, you know, because of what you went through. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I, when, I, when I think about really the highs, um, I don't actually think about cases we won um, uh, or um, matters we brought. I, you know, I do, I do think about some of the consumers we helped when it was really tangible in the consumer protection side where you actually got money back for people and who, who could ill afford to lose it and you gave it. I mean, there were, there were wonderful highs like that. But mostly um, when I think about the high share, it's, it, it's really about the people. And, and I know, again, it sounds so cliche, but um, I had someone ask me pretty early on in my career um, what my legacy would be, which is sort of funny. I mean, it gives you that Monty Python and the Holy Grail, you know, I'm not dead yet <laughs> kind of a thing. But it actually turned out to be a really great thing because if you think about it, I mean, you might think it's a little arrogant to think about it, but if you do think about it, what's important to you in that regard, it then shapes what you do for the, with your time, right? And what I realize is that, that winning the cases and doing the deals and you know, keeping Procter & Gamble out of trouble, what have you, that's, that's my job. That's what I, you know, I need to do that. But there's another whole part of these jobs that is what I really, really valued, and that is taking care of the people and helping to develop them and helping set them on their path. And, and I realized that that what I wanted my legacy to be, and it shaped how I did my job. Um, and, um, and, and because you have to, 
all these problems, you can't solve them on your own. You have to have uh, these people. And you know, Cheryl's where it really hits home, and you know this too, and Bill and, and Kevin know it. <laughs> when you first walk into a federal agency and people don't know you and they're looking at you, like, why would I listen to you? Why? <laughs> Do you know, who are you? You don't even know what you're doing, right? <laughs> and what you learn right away is, I need these people. Yeah. And I need to roll up my sleeves with them and let them know I have their back and I'm gonna be there with them. And so that's sort of, that learning has sort of helped me throughout. A couple of points that were really, really tough. When I first got to the Justice Department in 2001, and I truly did not know what I was doing, and I was pretty young, um, you know, like I am now. <laughs> and um, um, and we, we were ordered by a federal judge to settle the Microsoft case. And this was a case that had been going on for seven years. It had gone up to the Court of Appeals in the DC Circuit and come back down. The DC Circuit threw out two thirds of the case and the judge said in an order in which she starts, and this was in 2001, on September 11, 2001, our nation's priorities changed. This case has been going on for seven years. It needs to be over and I'm ordering you into settlement negotiations, and I want you negotiating 24 hours a day, seven days a week for five weeks. Now, there was one big problem with that, aside from the obvious, which is that I was getting married two weeks from then. <laughs> um, so that was a little bit of a challenge. But we did settle the case. Um, the judge eventually ordered us into mediation, and we settled the case. And we were criticized, I mean, royally criticized by people who wanted Microsoft to be broken up, and that was the original remedy. Now, of course, the DC Circuit had taken that remedy off the table. <laughs> we did not have that remedy available to us. We, the, uh, the case had been changed, but nonetheless, Microsoft's competitors didn't want to hear that, and so, um, and so we were roundly criticized. We were called corrupt by some people, um, and I gotta tell you, I was just a lawyer. I was just an antitrust lawyer. I looked at the case not as a politician. I didn't even know how to be a politician. I'd never worked on a campaign in my entire life. I was a mere lawyer. I was just lawyering the problem as I lawyered problems. But I learned a lot, so much about the world of criticism, about what matters, about whose opinion of you must matter. Because there were a lot of times then in the FTC, a lot of times at P&G where you have to stand up. You have to stand up um, for what you think is right and people aren't necessarily going to like it. Now the victory in that one was I was able to argue in the DC Circuit um, in favor of the settlement, which was super fun. Robert Bork was my, um, was, was my opposing counsel in that, so I was standing <laughs> up next to him. <laughs> and, um, and we won. And, um, and that, was, you know, that was one of the victories I think about, um, but also because the district court judge had taken the time when she approved the settlement to write another whole section at the end that said, there's been a lot of criticism of this, but until you really dig into it, you don't know how really good a solution this was. So, you know, there are, there are, there's a little bit of that, but you don't, you don't wait for vindication. You have to do, you have to do what's right. Um, so that's, you know, just was a huge lesson. And then I'll just give you one quick one on the, on the personal side, and I know I've been talking a lot, there, but um, it's kind of a broad question. That's the question. point. <laughs> <laughs> we want you to, we want to learn from you. Some people have heard this one, I think. <laughs> Stop me if you've heard this one. Um, so I had been at the Department of Justice um, for about a year and a half uh, when my boss, who was running the antitrust division, Charles James, decided to leave and take the job as Chevron's general counsel. And so the question is, who would replace him? And I was in the running, as was my colleague, who was also a deputy, Hugh Pate, who a lot of you also know. And Hugh and I had become very good friends as colleagues. And so, you know, you're in the running. And, you know, it's sort of... It's sort of hard because you're in the public eye. Now, no one is watching you as much as you think they are. Okay, so let's just, let's just get that straight right now. But you, know, but you know, people are saying things to you like, oh, you know you're gonna get it, but you, but you know you might not, right? So it's just kind of uh, one, of, one of those things. And what became clear to me um, over time was that I was not gonna get it and that Hugh was going to get it. And Hugh was eminently qualified. I mean, unbelievably so. And you know, people start to, say things to you, you know, you're, 
your posse is uh, more defensive of you than you even are of yourself, right? So I start to get this, it's unfair, it's because you're a woman, you know, this and that, you should leave, don't take it. And um, fortunately I had a little bit of time to kind of think it through and think through what I wanted. I was only 37 years old, <laughs> so it's sort of like, there's time. So, I, so anyway, the Attorney General, to his credit, um, had scheduled a meeting with me to tell me, and by then I pretty much knew. And so he told me that they had chosen Hugh for the job and that he very much hoped that I would stay and work with Hugh. We made a great team. And I really not sure I knew what I was gonna say until that moment. And what I said was, thank you very much, Mr. Attorney General. You've made a fantastic choice because Hugh is a wonderful patriot and a fine lawyer, and he will serve very, very well. And I will stay and serve with him because I love my job and I love serving the people of this country. And like, just imagine, no offense, I don't mean to be sexist, but like three alpha males going. <laughs> <laughs> now, I then walked out of the Attorney General's office and burst into tears and Charles, <laughs> Charles was with me, he's like shoving me in the elevator, get the elevator! <laughs> <laughs> because it, because things, things sting personally, right? I mean, no one likes to feel rejected. No one likes to. But what I realized is I really did love the job. I wasn't just in it for me. And, um, and Hugh, you know, was, was quite deserving. And I have to tell you that that year I spent working with him after that was like one of the best years of my career. We had a blast. We had so much fun. You know, today he's the general counsel of Chevron. I was the general counsel of P&G. We're the close, closest of friends. We're like brother and sister. We fight. Um, but, uh, but we get along great. And, um, and I think about that, um, you know, I, I would have missed out on that if I had decided to, to go away pouting, um, uh, which, you know, some people do. It's, sometimes you think it's the Washington way. The other thing that happened later was... Um, uh, when, the, when the White House Counsel's Office called me in the next year to ask me if I would be considered for the chairman of the FTC, I learned that, um, that they went to the president and said, here's what happened at the DOJ. This person is not just in it for herself. And uh, so we think that she's worthy of this service. So it's, you know, what I really learned from all that is no one thinks ill of you when you have disappointments and tough stuff in your life, it's how you react. That's what people then react and judge you on. So, um, so I, you know, that was just a great lesson for me because you can be, when you're young, like charge, charge, charge ahead, and it's hard if somebody stops you from the charging. Um, but um, but it, was a great, it was a great period of learning, to be sure. Yeah. It, it's that adage, it's a... It's a marathon, not a sprint, right? Which it's hard to understand when you're younger. I yeah. know I was a big sprinter, and so it is yeah. very hard to understand that. And when, when I first interviewed at Procter & Gamble, I interviewed to be the chief legal officer, and they never hired from the outside. Like, all their people come from inside, as Dan O'Sullivan does. <laughs> and um, and so, um, so they, were, they were literally afraid that if they brought me in as an officer of the company, people would leave. Doesn't that make you feel good? Like, oh, good. <laughs> I, I want to go work with you. Um, so, they, so they asked me to come in as one level below this role um, for a while to get to know the people and, and to kind of earn my way to it. And I agreed. And a lot of my posse, again, were like, what are you, what are you crazy? Like, why would you do that? And I said, because I want to work for this company. And because they're probably right. It probably is good for me to learn the company since, as, as many of you know, the currency in any company, firm, whatever, is relationships. And if you don't have them, you better get them in a hurry. So that lesson at DOJ helped me to accept that when I went to P&G that, you know, I can be patient, I can, I can do this. And truthfully, um, when I quickly got promoted, the team was behind me because they knew me. Um, that sounded a little self-serving, sorry. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, the, but I, I then I felt I was one of them, which yes. mattered to them. Yes. So. Oh, good. Okay. Well, uh, given that we have a lot of uh, antitrust and consumer protection and privacy folks here, it would be helpful to know that background. Um, you, FTC, you saw everything, consumer protection, privacy, and antitrust, obviously antitrust at DOJ and in your practice. Do you think it made you a different or did it impact your time as a CLO at PNG? Yeah, th there's really no question. Um, first of all, I actually think 
we all become better lawyers when we um, when we've been on different sides and, and forced to think through the different sides of issues. I think it's okay. This is a this is a not what you asked me, but I'll just say it. I think it's a, I think it's a horrible thing in our profession right now that lawyers are being identified with the causes of their clients and being attacked for it. I mean that is very bad. I think for our profession, but even more so um, for our country. So so I actually think we're better when we can think of those sides. And so so when I went into the into the CLO role, um, you know one of the things you're seeing in the jobs. Uh, you know, that we had in the agencies is, you know, some real breakdowns, right? I mean, I genuinely believe that companies mostly are trying to do the right thing. Most people are. I think people stumble. I think people make mistakes, and some of them go down a bad, slippery slope. But what you end up seeing on the enforcement side are just a lot of um, mistakes from just inaction, from inattention, from, you know, um, because there's a lot of things to think about. And so, kind of coming into the company side, I really realized how important it is to get very close to the business. Now, some people think that's dangerous because they say, wait a minute, you know, we have to, we have, to have a certain amount of objectivity. I don't think the two are mutually exclusive at all. I think absolutely positively you can be more independent when you know and understand these people, when you've developed a good partnership with them and they trust you, mm -hmm. um, which I think is what we did. And so, so when you see the kinds of breakdowns where um, you, know, it, you end up with a, a CEO and a general counsel in, in your office you know, when I'm at the FTC, and they're talking to me and I'm realizing, like, you don't have any clue what actually happened. That, I don't think you do, right? I mean, I know you've got your talking right. points, but it's just clear to me you don't. And, and that's gonna be the case most of the time. You can expect the CEO to know everything, but what we have to do as a legal department is we have to penetrate and we have to know and understand what's going on um, in, the industries, uh, in the industries in which we operate. And you know, that's certainly the case for PNG. We have um, so many different markets and so many different geographies. We have good, healthy markets market shares in a lot of those, and so it's really important for us to understand the practices um, that, are, that are going on. Privacy is another one, right? We, we brought a lot of privacy um, cases when I was at the FTC, we brought the first ones. But there were a bunch we didn't bring, and the reason we didn't bring them is because even though there was a breakdown, when we went in and took a look, the company had done all of the right things. It's just you can't prevent everything from happening. And so what I also realized is you have to put in the investment to those preventive measures um, and then hope, <laughs> then, although hope is not a strategy, that, um, <laughs> that, um, that thing, but there will be breakdowns. And then if you can show authorities, look, <laughs> here's what we did. We, did. we did our best, we educated our people, we, you know, um, and, um, and so, so those things I think were, were important lessons to take um, into the company. So I think um, you know having someone who served 14 years as a chief legal officer, dealing with CEOs, dealing with the board, dealing with a 500-person global staff, can you just give us a little bird's eye view into the day of the life that you led oh, for those years? Just kind of, what was your calendar like? What was you know what, what was on your mind? I think it would help all of us on the outside as we counsel people to know what their day to day is like. And I think for those of us that report into or ha have reported into a, a GC, it's helpful to just know what. What your what your day is like? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's so funny. There's just uh, not really a typical day, you know. I, I'm always trying to get organized, and I make list after list. And, you know, maybe you do too. And then of course your list gets blown up by about 7 a.m. in the morning, and so so now you put down stuff on your list that you've already done, so they can cross it off and feel like you've done something for the day. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I really I really separated the job into three pieces. Um, there was the piece of running the legal department, and I had also government relations. Um, I had um, our anti-counterfeit group. You can only imagine the products we make. Counterfeiting is really a big deal. Um, and, and then I had a dotted line relationship with quality assurance. So sort of, you know, running all of that. And a lot of that really is a leadership role, um, you know, just relying on excellent lawyers and other professionals, right? Because um, and, and that includes relying on them to tell me things I need to know, 
Um, the second piece um, is being an advisor to the CEO and the rest of the senior management team. And some of those, you sometimes feel like you're part psychologist and part or counselor and part legal counselor, right? Um, uh, because for whatever reason, a lot of people, well, some people, times people would even say that to me, well, you're the lawyer. I know you can't repeat any of this. <laughs> You know, so, um, <laughs> um, yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. There was a time when the company was not doing well. Um, coming out of the recession, and I, I said to to my assistant, just put Lucy five cents above my <laughs> above my conference room from door. the peanuts. Uh, yes, from yeah, peanuts. from peanuts. Yeah. Um, and then the third part um, was I was the corporate secretary as well, and and so dealt very extensively with our board of directors. So I sort of separated, you know, thinking about the role that way. Um, but look, when I got up in the morning, um, you know, we do, we sell into 180 countries. So when I get up in the morning, got up in the morning, um, you know, uh, China and Asia are done with their day. Mm -hmm. Europe is halfway through their day, Europe and Africa, you know, and, and we're just, um, and the Americas, we're just starting our day. So the first thing that I had to do was check my email um, and text just to see, like, and you know, it's like this. <laughs> you know, because as I say, when you do business in 180 countries, the crap's going down somewhere all the time. Okay, <laughs> so you know what happened. Um, you know, overnight, um, I like to get in early because it really is the only time I have for trying to organize my thoughts, trying to prioritize. You know, what I tr what I need to try to get done. Um, and so um, I admit there was a time when it just got earlier and earlier because I would was obsessed with getting in before anyone else did. <laughs> um, but um, uh, so, so a lot of it looked like this. Our, our floor at Procter & Gamble, our executive floor, was designed to be open space. Then you had your own conference room. So it was designed for people to stop by. Um, so lots and lots of executives stopping by to say, hey, while I, while I have you, da, da, da. And that's, that's actually the importance of getting back to the office. I hate to say this, I know a lot of people don't want to do it, but you know, half the time, if you're not right in front of them, they won't do that, mm -hmm. right? And that's actually a really important thing in terms of not just their issue of that day, but building those relationships and that trust, which is key, absolutely key with the executive team. Um, so a lot of, you know, a lot of drive by, a lot of emails, a lot of, uh, calling Jamie and saying, "Can I have 15 minutes with her?" And it was never 15; it was all, it was always longer. And I always made time for those. Um, you know, that those those were my partners at PNG, um, and of course the CEO. Um, uh, a lot of a lot of, of contact there. You feel like you are always preparing for the next board meeting. You know, you bounce from one. You know, they're every two months, but that. Two months goes by really, really quickly, and um, and those are really, really important. So lots of meetings with the CEO. Um, the truth of the matter is, I feel like um, companies are always in recruitment for board members right now. I mean, it's it's insane. It used to be so easy to get good board members, and CEOs would serve on two boards in addition to their own, and you know, and um, and now it's completely changed which is good because we have a lot more diversity on boards. We, we're, we're going beyond the CEO ranks, which means we are getting more women and minorities and just more people with talent. Um, but it's a constant thing. I mean, I just feel like I spent so much time with our CEO searching, um, searching for board members. Then there's the constant meetings with um, various members of my team, right? Need to update you on this on this case. Need to talk about whether we're going to make a settlement offer in this case. We're getting ready to go to trial. We're getting ready for an argument and so on. I didn't do a ton of negotiating deals or going to court. Or, I just didn't. I, I just viewed that as I can't. I can't put any too much time. Fortunately, while I was there, we didn't have like mostly bet the company stuff. Um, so I let my senior people generally be in the front lines of those things, and I was more in the background helping to coach and direct and be the conduit uh, to the team. And, and you know, there were um, there are crises. When I first got to p and I hadn't even gotten there yet. I hadn't even started. I'm sitting in our new house in Cincinnati on the floor, in the kitchen, putting pans away, and my husband, John, who some of you may know, who's another lawyer at Jones Day, hands me my phone, his phone and says, you, you better take a look at this. European Commission, Don Raid's detergents industry. <laughs> oh, that's lovely. Sure enough, I get the phone call. Can you start a week early? Um, and, um, and off we went. And I really spent the first year 
of my time there really, really dealing with that. So that was, you know, sometimes you are in these crisis modes. We had two activist shareholders come into the stock while I was there, one who launched a proxy contest against us in 2017. It was at the time the largest proxy contest in history. Um, we just have so many outstanding shares. <laughs> and, um, and so, um, you know, I was crisscrossing all around the country on airplanes talking to investors about uh, why we didn't need um, why we didn't need Nelson on our board? It went to a draw. I think he ended up a GE. <laughs> <laughs> he did. He did. He did end up at GE, but he also, well, actually, his son-in-law ended up at GE. <laughs> but but he did come on our board because because it it right. went we went to a draw basically, and so, and I remember when that happened, Sheris, and and um, and I was one of the people who advocated to the CEO. It's time. This is over. I mean, we were having the, the ballots counted. I mean, you know, when you have billions of outstanding shares, you have all these shares outstanding, and the, and the count on the ballots is coming in. Well, now we're 300,000 ahead. Well, now they're 500. Well, wait a minute. Why were we 300,000 ahead, and now they're 500,000? Oh, because some of the paper ballots were sticking together. I mean, this is, I mean, this is like a guy in a garage. You think this is like, you, know, you think this is like this formal thing. I have to go to my CEO and lead director and tell them that the count's all screwy and whatever. And they're like, but it's the inspector of election. And I'm like, yeah, and he's a drunk in a garage, <laughs> which he was. So, I mean, we couldn't talk to him before 11 o'clock because he was hung over. So it was, I mean, you know, so you just have these moments. So I finally said, it's, over. It's time. It, we need to, and I had people in the company resisting me big time, not to mention banks. We need to stop this. We need to negotiate this guy onto the board. And my team said to me, they were all, you know, they were sad and upset. We've been working on this for months and months. They said, it's like you just flipped a switch. I said, because I did. <laughs> because it's not personal. This is our job. What's best for the company in this moment versus this moment and now? And so we, that's our job to do it. So, so sometimes you're dealing with crisis, sometimes um, you know, when you're lucky, uh, you're not. But, um, but there, were, there were plenty of them. Okay, so fitting, I know one of the things that you've been talking about just offline that you wanted to talk about today is wellness. Huh. So it seems kind of ironic to be talking about shareholder you know, <laughs> disputes and, and flipping to wellness, but I know that's really important to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so tell us what you want us to know about wellness. What should we all be thinking about? How should we be thinking about it? How do you think about it? Well, I came to it late. You know, I, I was one of, I was, you know, an associate who, in a law firm who, you know, built some years, 2,800 hours, and I was, um, uh, I could get away with it. You know, I had a younger body. <laughs> uh, and, um, and then, um, you know, people, I, I didn't even realize it until my going away at the FTC and, and someone stood up and said, you know, her car was there when we got here in the morning and her car was there when we left at night. And, um, and I started out that way at P&G too. Um, but what you realize, and I think honestly, that's a place where age kind of kicks you in the ass a little bit and makes you realize like you just, this is not sustainable. You know, job after job with such intensity and always thinking that, you're, that you'll take care of yourself later and so, I mean, I just really started to get serious about it. In fact, when we started the proxy contest, I was about to embark on some new stuff that I wanted to do with my nutrition and sleep and fitness and so on. And normally in my career, when a big crisis occurred, I would just stop all the health stuff, right? <laughs> and say, that'll have to wait. And I decided not to. And so the brain is a powerful thing if we just use it, right? And so I just, I really tried to change my mentality. And so instead of saying, you know, I deserve to jump back on the airplane and down some wine and a bag of peanut M&Ms. I really tried to make myself say, you know, you deserve good healthy food. You deserve a good night's sleep. You deserve, um, uh, uh, you know, to move throughout the day and get exercise. And so I tried it during that. And um, it's so funny because Nelson Peltz, who did ultimately get, end up on our board and who, with whom I became pretty good friends, always laughs and says, I'm responsible for Debbie's fantastic, you know, health today. Um, <laughs> No, you're not, Nelson. But um, but um, so so what I so I really started to get interested in the subject and what a group endeavor it is. So so I noticed that habits I had developed. I looked around me and my people were following, right? Ah, uh, and okay. um, you know, it's a group you're thing. Role modeling, it's, role it's modeling, a, helpful, yeah, role yeah. modeling, and we do it for each other. And it's also like supporting each other because it's 
I don't think there's anything harder in our lives than finding the balance, right? It's not just about the nutrition and exercise, but it's the balance in our lives. And um, and and everywhere I went around the country, around the world at P&G, people would ask me that question, and not just women. People would ask me that question: How do you find balance? And I was like, Well, I don't know that I'm that good at it, but here's what I'm trying. Here are the things I'm trying, and we had really good discussions about it. So. Um, so we started, I started to get a lot more interested in it and to be very, very open about the journey, to find tools that could really help my team. And so um, we have an employee survey um, process every year at Proctor, which a lot of you probably do, and people take it very, very seriously. We get great return rates. And like in 2011, my scores on well-being for my people were like 53% positive. And in 2021, which is another pandemic year, they were almost 90%. Oh, wow. That's a huge jump. Yeah. I mean, it took, it took 10 years, but, but it, was, um, it was just a lot of, um, some of it is just people, I hate this, but it's true. We're all looking for permission to take care of ourselves. We're looking for permission to say it's okay, right? And, and we shouldn't have to, because as I tell my people, it's not just that I'm doing you a favor by wanting to take, I want you to have a fresh brain. I want you to be on your toes, right? And you can't be if you, if you are looking at it as just you know work harder, 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 as opposed to work smarter, smarter, smarter. And if you don't take breaks and you don't, um, and we see it now. I mean, the generation we're hiring now is a lot more in tune with mental health stuff. And, um, and uh, if we don't get our act together on it, um, we're in trouble because I don't know how we I don't know how we're going to manage, um, especially post pandemic. These these, right? these folks, yeah. So anyway, to we work. took what we learned in legal, and then um, coming out of the pandemic last year, I really pushed P and G, um, and said, you know, we need to do better on this as a company, and I want to start a new program, and I want to push this, and and uh, they agreed, and so I co-led that. Um, uh, I just felt like it's a little bit like I feel about equality and inclusion. If you, just, if you just say it's a program and someone's telling me what to do, you're kind of losing the thread. Mm -hmm. Similarly on well-being, if you just let it be an HR program that people can opt in and out of, no. I mean, is it going to be a way of life for us or isn't it? And, and what does that mean? And if you don't have leadership support um, for both of those, right, but in this case well-being, um, then people will think that they're not allowed to take care of themselves, that they're not allowed to, um, you know, talk about a tough struggle in their life or, or, um, or what have you. So I, I think if we, and I think if we, if, the reason I thought coming out of the pandemic was the right time was because we'd been focused on health for two years, but we'd been focused primarily on physical health, but we needed to shift to thinking more about mental health as well. Um, and because we're, we're exploring as all of you are, what does the hybrid workplace look like? What does it look like to have more flexibility, yet make sure you bring people together enough that, um, that the magic happens? So, um, so anyway, what I would say is um, today's the day. Don't wait. <laughs> and um, you know, think about it for yourself and for your teams. I, you know, I think it's, I think it's um, essential, and I think it makes our teams a lot stronger when we actually are willing to think about it. This fire is awfully hot. It is it? hot. <laughs> I'm this is definitely a fireside it's, chat. Yeah, right. it has its pros and cons. It's very <laughs> warm over here. Um, okay, so you, you've touched on it a little bit, but I, I wouldn't mind. We are lucky to have a wonderfully diverse group here, and I'd like to talk a little bit about being a female leader and being a female CLO and then shift over to leadership generally, if we could. Mm -hmm. So does it matter? Did it matter? Did, it, did your gender matter every day? Yeah. How did you think about it? You know, honestly, and I know sometimes people have either not believed me or thought I'm incredibly naive, but mostly it didn't matter to me. I really, I just, I just haven't approached it that way in my career. I just haven't come in every morning and said, today I'm the female CLO. It just, I just am, right? And, um, and look, I can tell you plenty of stories of things, you know, um, because I, you know, things that have happened over time. Um, as a result of being female that were not, you know, particularly great or pleasant or whatever. But not at P&G. I mean, I, I just, I didn't, I, I, for the most part, um, just didn't notice it. Look, the way I try to look at it is we're all going to get slighted sometimes. People aren't always going to treat us well and people are going to disrespect us. And I don't, unless it's really blatant, I don't really know necessarily. 
I can make an assumption that it's because I'm female or, you know, um, and, and by the way, that can be treatment from guys or treatment from other women, right? I mean, either way. Um, but mostly because it hasn't been some really bad thing, there's, there, I just feel like there's no percentage in thinking about it that way. Like, like if someone's disrespecting me and I think so, I just go, I just go to them and say, hey, what did you mean by that in that meeting? I'm, I'm curious. I, I, I don't know that you intended it, but here's how, here's how I felt about that. And people are like, holy crap, because people don't expect to get called down on things, right? Mm -hmm. So, but I do it directly rather than talking behind the back. And, and certainly, if someone writes an email that's even semi offensive or subject to interpretation. I pick up the phone and call. It scares the crap out of people when the chief legal officer shows up on there. Um, but because people, people don't call each other anymore. They schedule time with each other. It's like, I'm not gonna schedule five minutes with you. Um, so um, so I, like to, I like to head things off up front. Even when I know someone's being kind of shitty. Well, you know, you call them out on it, they know. They might say, oh no, I didn't mean that. They did mean it, but that's okay, because now they know. They're on notice. <laughs> I know too. We know. Um, so, so honestly, Sharers, I'm not gonna say it doesn't accept, of course, right? Um, but I feel really blessed to have, um, to have been in um, a job where I really do believe that the CEOs, the board, you know, my team, I think, I think people really, we had a lot of mutual respect for each other, all of it that we earned together. So in this job, I didn't have a lot. Now, when I was at the FTC, there was one thing I always remember. So, um, so uh, because there's ageism as well as sexism, yes, right? Yes. And, and sometimes the two go together. And so, you know, in the job I had, I had a lot of um, senior partners, but also GCs and CEOs, you know, were in my office. And that wasn't usually a good thing for them. Um, they weren't real happy. And I remember when I would go out to their, um, uh, to my reception area to pick them up, and I would just see this. It might have been my imagination, but I don't think so. This little in their eyes, of like a little disappointment or a little um, curiosity. Like I always felt like it was. Excuse me, I'm here to see the chairman. <laughs> You don't look like, you know, and, and then they recovered quickly. And people said, well, how do you handle it? Well, the way I handled it was to say, I don't care what look they have in their eye when they walk in. The question is, how is it when they walk out, right? I mean, I can only equip myself when they're there in front of me. I can't, I can't. And hopefully if they had some bias, I'm helping shove that away. Um, so, uh, so again, I don't mean to seem naive. Um, there's definitely issues out there, but I feel like I've been, um, been pretty blessed. And, and if I look back over the arc, um, there's no way I would say that I didn't have a chance to succeed on the merits. Well, and I do remember when uh, you were chair, you gathered senior women together at your home. Oh, yeah. Remember that? And yeah, I remember yeah. <laughs> I remember you saying, I realize your support has been really meaningful. Yeah. When I come down off the dais, the women are standing there. That's cetera, true. Right? That's really true. Yeah. No, it's very true. They're really rallying around. And, um, um, and, and of course, those were the days um, which there weren't very many of us. I know, I know. But also, um, and Bill and Kevin, you know, we kind of longed for this. It didn't matter what side of the aisle we were from. Like we were, fr you know what I mean. Exactly. We worked in different ministries, exactly. but we were close friends, and we were close. Friends, right? Yeah. It didn't matter. And it, and I, I I bemoan that it seems to matter a little bit more now. Yes. Okay. I'm mindful of the time because I want to make sure that there's questions that people have time to ask oh. questions. So start thinking of your questions, and we'll give you a microphone. Oh. But I would love to, if that's okay. That's mm -hmm. okay. But I would love to talk a little bit about the 500 people that reported to you, yeah. right? And you must have seen things that were helpful and things that were less than helpful. So can you? Go guide some of our in-house counsel as a CLO, your reports or your team, just, you know, what, what works, what doesn't work, what your thoughts are on that? Yeah. Um, I really subscribe to a philosophy I've learned over time that um, true leaders are uh, people who others choose to follow. So whether they report to you or not, um, you know, how do they feel? Would they want to follow you into battle, so to speak? And um, and so, how do you how do you get there? Well, the way I've tried to get there, um, you know, we talk a lot now about leadership authenticity. That's like become a thing, and um, so everyone's trying to learn to be authentic, um, and that's okay. <laughs> No, and I, I, sh I shouldn't make fun of it because leadership is not born, it is learned, there's no doubt about it. But in the end, um, where I think, um, you know, I think, I think a number of things are really important. First, it's just a mentality of, 
I mean, when I was younger, I, I thought being a leader meant that um, it, it would be all about me. I, I could do anything I wanted, right? <laughs> Um, and then you realize it's not, I mean, you are the last person in the world actually it's about. It's, it's truly about the team. It's about what are their needs, what, um, how do you inspire and motivate them. Um, and, um, and so for me, Shiris, um, if there's one thing I feel very proud of, and I, um, you know, leaving P&G has been very emotional. Um, uh, people, I surprised people. You know, why are you going out on top? Well, I've just been doing this a long time. I'd like to have energy to do some other things in my life. Um, and I have a stack of books about this high. Photos from travels, notes from people, all of my people all around the world. And, um, and the thing that I might be most proud of is that all the, so many people who said, you knew me, you cared about me. Um, and, um, and people were actually joking about it at one of my going away parties, like, <laughs> like how apparently one time a group of people were having drinks together, some of my people, they're like, she's my best friend. No, she's my best friend, you know. <laughs> I'm her best That's friend. Good. <laughs> That's, yeah. um, but, but what I'm saying is um, I, I really worked to treat everyone as a human being, as someone who comes to us with a lot of skills, but with a whole other part of their life that's important to them. And that matters to the whole scheme of things. And so I think, um, I think leaders have to find how to bring, the best, bring out the best in people. And I did it at a fairly personal level. Now, when you do that, you, you've, you do sometimes have some uncomfortable moments where it's sort of like, are people getting a little too close? I mean, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. like, but that's okay. I'd rather have people occasionally cross a, a little bit of a boundary than hold myself up away from them. I was um, not above them. I was of them and with them. And that we felt together and we accomplished a lot doing that. So I, I just think that's really important in leadership and this idea of kind of arrogant leaders that know everything. Um, it's, it's a myth. It's dumb. I mean, I used to think I could control everything. I used to try to be a perfectionist. And now I'm a recovering control freak perfectionist because I'm in recovery always <laughs> because perfectionism and control are addictions, really. And I, I don't mean to be flippant. I really think they are. So um, you can't relate to people if you're trying to control them. Um, and you can't, they won't relate to you if you're trying to make everybody perfect. So those things I think are really important. And, um, and again, it goes to, um, you know, what the cases that we won I'll probably forget about you know two years from now, but I won't forget those people. And of course, I have all those books <laughs> to remind me. No, that's right. And I, 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 as people know, I got stuck in Denver and listened to podcasts. And one of the things that was stuck out on, on leadership, and, and one was be the, be the a good team member is the best leader. Mm -hmm. If someone that you want on your team mm -hmm. is the best leader, and that was kind of a new concept to me. Mm -hmm. Actually, it sounds like what you're saying, mm -hmm. and and things that. That's where people sort of miss the mark with you and you help them recover? Like, can you give us a little sense of that? Yeah, I mean, obviously there's, um, you know, there's the classic dropping the ball. I mean, some people, um, when I pass something off um, to someone, I totally trust it. I, I actually, I actually, it goes out of my head half the time, right? I mean, it's like, I, I have entrusted you and until you come back to me, I'm not thinking about this anymore. Mm -hmm. And sometimes people fail you in that regard. Well, why didn't you call, you know, the person at EOJ or why didn't you do, you know? Um, and um, so that's, um, I want people who I can really count on. And if you're going through something, you can't do it, then you need to fess up and say, I can't do this right now. And I'm totally understanding of that. Um, uh, I think there's, and, and then there are, um, and this is, you know, everything's always the two sides of a coin. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things I love about P&G and the legal departments, um, they really want to be practicing lawyers. So it's not just like throw everything over the transom to outside counsel and, um, and they like to own it. Um, but then sometimes um, if I would hear about an issue from one of my business colleagues before I heard about it from my lawyers, and sometimes they make a mistake, but there were certain repeat offenders. And it's like, well, why didn't you, you didn't tell me? Well, they like to own it. And somehow it, it felt to them, especially if they didn't know me well yet, it felt to them like, like, like um, a problem if they had to tell. And it's like, no, 
just an FYI is really, really good. The heads up. Because if I have to hear this from my colleague and I don't know what they're talking about, that's not good for any of us, right? As a legal team, we need to, we need to uh, work this together. And oh, by the way, I can't really have your back if I don't know what I'm having your back about. Um, so that's, that's something that mattered a lot to me. And some people were really, really good at intuitively knowing when to, when to raise it. But you can learn it, right? I mean, you know, um, and um, so those are, um, those are some of the things. Um, that, and then the final thing I'll say is, and some of you I'm sure experience this, like as much as I love Procter, there's still too much bureaucracy and, you know, it, like in these big companies, you know, and, um, and I get so tired, like, hold on a minute. I don't care what band level this person is. I don't care what the title is. I don't, you know, I wanna know three things, okay? What's the problem to be solved? Who are the best people to solve it? And how do we get them together? Don't tell me about seniority. Don't tell, I don't care. Those things exist so that we don't have chaos. They don't exist to slow us down. So if you let them slow me down, I'm not gonna be happy about it. That's great advice. <laughs> All right, I'm trying to do a check. Do, do people have questions? Oh, okay. Yes. All right, can I give you this? Is that okay with the questions? Yeah, okay. oh, watch your mic, the oh, other one. Oh, right, my little thing here. Oh, sorry. <laughs> First, this has been so great. Thank you so much. Um, so l listening a little bit about your leadership style, it's just fascinating. So here's the question. Building people and growing people when they report directly to you is one thing, right? Mm -hmm. It's easier to coach. Mm -hmm. How do you grow people at scale and how do you lead at scale? Like yeah. what are your best tips? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great question. Um, I think the first thing is um, to be really accessible whenever you can. So. Um, so one of the things that I realized when I was traveling internationally was that, um, I mean, I think I was sitting somewhere in the world completely jet lagged in a dark conference room for two days staring at PowerPoint. <laughs> and so I asked myself the question, you know, I mean, for those of you in law firm, you know how much companies love PowerPoint. I mean, it's ridiculous. You want to talk about it? You want to? You want to talk about an addiction? I mean, oh my God! But I first got to PAG, and I was going to talk for five minutes on someone. And says, "When will you send us your slides? I won't have slides. I'm going to talk, and you're going to look at me." Um, anyway, I digress. Um, but one of the things I realized was, why am I doing this? I can sit back in Cincinnati and look at PowerPoint. Like I'm not. I'm here to get to know these people. So what I started doing on my international travels, and then I had, but then I realized I had to do it in North America too, right? I mean, was um, take time and go do something fun with the people. So I remember the first time we did it. And it's so funny, the young lawyers, they didn't know what to do. I said, we were in Panama, I said, enough PowerPoint, we're going to the canal. I love the Panama Canal. I think it's like one of the coolest things ever. So we're going to the canal. So get a van, let's go. So we go out there, it's like Thursday afternoon. I buy everybody a beer, it's all awkward. One of, the young, one of the young lawyers comes up. Uh, so, Debbie, uh, have you read any good books lately? I mean, you know, they didn't even know what to do. It was so cute. And, um, but I just started break, you know, but I just started breaking it down. Like, I am not up here and you're here. Like, we're people, let's just get to know each other. So I really, really, um, you know, you ask yourself the question, what's your job? motivating the people, developing the people. Um, how do you do it? Well, you've got to get to know them and you've got to understand what makes them tick and you want them to, um, if you think about it, I mean, I've got like a couple, I had a couple of lawyers in Kazakhstan, you know, one of the most corrupt places on earth. How do I keep them in our orbit and not that, you know, how do we keep them? So, um, so getting to know them, um, so I did that a, a lot. I did um, a lot of one-to-ones. In lieu of all the PowerPoint, when I went places, I did one-to-ones with people, even junior people. I did lunches with administrative assistants, group, groups of them, um, where we would just sit and talk about what's on their minds and what are they, you know. Um, it just takes all that hierarchy out and helps people to, um, to understand, I'm invested in you. So you sort of start with that. I mean, it seems, I don't mean to be trite about it, but people actually just want to know that leadership cares. Like that's really a big important first step. And you have to show you care. You can't just say it, you have to show it. And then you really have to work on the people who report to you and then, th and then their reports on what your expectations are in developing the people. For too long, the legal profession, and there are others too, but we'll pick on, that's because that's us. Just, we just thought that leaders would be developed you know, by osmosis and, you know, maybe they would, maybe they wouldn't. I mean, law firms are guilty of this too, right? I mean, you take, you take the best litigator and put the person in charge of 
litigation, you know, wasn't necessarily the best leader, right? Um, I mean, in the case of my husband, he's both, but, uh, <laughs> um, but, <laughs> but you know, but, but you, then you really, you really have to pay attention to what they're doing with their people, and you have to listen to the signals. Because the hardest thing when you're a leader is that no one will tell you anything. Like, you have to be very open, which means you have to be very open to bad news. You can't, like, jump on people when they tell you things you don't want to hear. Otherwise, no one's going to tell you. And I had, you know, I had people um, who were at more junior levels who I developed great rapport with, and, um, and they did tell me stuff, um, and important stuff. And I think it was just the, the openness. So it's, it's two things. It's your own personal investment in them, and then it's paying attention to what do we have in place for developing these people, and not just leaving it um, to everyone else. Because if you make clear to your people that this is important to you, and they're going to be judged on this, they'll, they'll work on it too, and they'll make it, they'll make it happen. Other questions that people have? So this is so helpful to hear all your um, leadership wisdom and insight. Um, going back to you talked about, I don't know, ball droppers and people who wouldn't give you an FYI when they needed to, the heads mm -hmm. up. So can you talk about, did you have repeat offenders? And if so, like, how did you coach people out of that? Yeah. And I guess, are there sometimes people who you can't coach and if you can't, what did you do? Yeah, um, I'll take I'll take the last one first. I, I mean, there are there are people um, for whom it's just not working out, and um, and the truth is, while some people w will go to the end swearing up and down that we were wrong and they were right, I, I actually have found in my anecdotes that generally speaking, if it's not working for us, it's probably not working for that person either. Now, nobody likes to be rejected. So there are ways you can try to let people down a little bit gently, but then they can, but then people have come back years later and said, you know what? I'm so much happier now than I was before. Um, to me on that one, um, two things are really important. First, as soon after someone um, disappoints you, um, d drops the ball or whatever, don't wait till their performance review to tell them. You need to tell them right away. Now, sometimes I wasn't ducking, um, but I, um, oh my gosh, Gary's in Fagnus here. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> I didn't see you back there. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, he never dropped the ball. Um, um, sometimes I would think it through with maybe their, if it was someone who didn't report directly to me, which often it wasn't, um, to say, perhaps you should tell them in the first instance, because especially if it's a Friday, I mean, if I say the slightest negative thing to someone, especially a junior person, it's like, especially with young people, it's, I mean, they're like devastated, right? So you have to think about the you know, the severity of the offense, if you will. And think about what's the best way to convey it. You don't, you're not trying to ruin people, and especially on Fridays. I try really hard not to do it on Fridays, because then people stew all weekend. And I'd rather tell them on a Monday or a Tuesday when, if they're really stewing, they can come back and, and talk. So that's the first thing, is, is, act, is act quickly and give people an opportunity to remedy. But when it's really not working out, I think, um, it has to be, there just has to be such candor. What I tell them, my people when we're talking this through is, um, do you believe in having respect for your people? Yes. You are not respecting your people if you don't tell them the truth about their performance. Now, you don't have to be a jerk about it. Um, so what I do is I write it out, what I want to say. Now, I don't then read it. It's just, here's the thing. People sometimes cry. It makes me cry. I'm a very emotional person. I want to cry too. But it's not fair to them if I hedge. I've seen this. They say, someone starts to cry. Well, maybe it's not so bad. Maybe we can make it up. You know, no, no. What do you have to say to them? Say it all. And they're they're adults. They can take it, and they deserve that, right? So that's that's the way I approach this. Very unpleasant. I hate it, but very important. And I just keep in my mind that whole respect thing. So that was the second part of the question. In terms of um, was the first part coaching on? Yeah. yeah. Like the first time it happens, you know, you mm -hmm. told them. Yeah. How do you help them recover? Yeah. Yeah, um, again, being very, being very candid with them and being very specific, right? Saying, Here, here's, how, here's how this could have been, here's how you might have handled this different. And if I can say something very positive about them, like, 
you know, remember when you did such and such? That was, that was really helpful to me because of da, 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 da. Here's why this was less so. So you know what I mean? So you're giving them a little bit of, um, uh, a little bit of um, oomph, you know, a positive um, feedback as well, if you, if you can, um, uh, to combine it. Because I'm telling you, if you give 98% positive feedback and 2% opportunity feedback, they will obsess on the two, because that's just the people we hire. They're just, that's just who we are. So, um, so it's good to bring the positive in when you can. Um, and, um, and then sometimes I'm self-deprecating about it. I'll, I'll tell them a story. I'll say, yeah, I remember the time that I did this and my boss was really unhappy and here's how I worked on recovering. Because right, then, we're, then we're talking as people as well and, and you know, I'm helping to guide and they're seeing that the mistakes aren't necessarily fatal, right? Here I am, I made that mistake before, whatever. So th things like that. I really just try to put myself as much as possible in their shoes um, and think through how it's gonna land. Because it's like I tell my people all the time on communication, I don't care what you intended. You have to think about how it's gonna land. You have to think about how that person is likely to hear it. And that's especially true you know, when you're in leadership positions because what's that saying about the king's whisper comes across as the roar of a lion. I mean, again, you say a small thing and all of a sudden, God, I remember one time I had to give us, I, I didn't get to have lunch because I had to speak at some big thing. And so afterward, I was like shaking like a leaf and completely hypoglycemic or whatever. So the word went around the entire Federal Trade Commission that you need to bring granola bars. And so, you know, <laughs> like, like, you know, suddenly I had more friggin' granola bars than I could possibly eat in a lifetime. But that's what happens when you're the leader. <laughs> so maybe one more question. All right. Over here. So I was hoping you could talk a little bit about how you transitioned when you came into the FTC to not just doing antitrust, but to learning consumer protection, or maybe you knew consumer protection before you got there. Yeah. No, I didn't, actually. And I felt like the consumer protection people might be a little suspicious of me. Uh, in fact, um, it was so nice when I, before I was confirmed, um, Jody Bernstein, who of course is iconic in consumer protection, took me to a huge, like, big consumer event, like a consumer's union thing or whatever, um, where she knew these folks would be entirely suspicious of me, A, coming into a Republican administration, and B, not knowing consumer protection. But Jody was such a class act, and she took me around and introduced me to all the big players in the consumer groups and said, time, I mean, I can hear her saying it, love Jody. I can hear her saying it. I think she's going to be a fabulous chairman, she would say to them. But that endorsement, you know, was huge for me before I went in, into the office. Um, a couple of other things, you know, you just, you just, um, it's so hard to suddenly be in charge and not know the stuff. Like, it's so hard. And so the temptation is to want to think you do when you don't. So you really just have to shut up a lot and listen a lot. Um, <laughs> And, um, and learn, and I ended up loving consumer protection. I mean, I just absolutely loved it. Um, but it, it's just such a fine group of people in that bureau. And I, I had as the acting consumer protection head, Lydia Parnas, who'd been there for such a long time. And Lydia and I became very close very quickly. And she was able to tell me straight up you know, you're screwing this up, or here's, I mean, we developed that relationship, and vice, vice versa, um, when I didn't like uh, the way something was coming out. And so, um, when it was time for me to put someone in there permanently, I'll tell you a little secret. Um, I was supposed to go to the White House personnel office and, um, you know, and find a Republican, which Lydia is not, uh, to put in the position, and, um, and I wanted uh, Lydia, so I just very quietly um, put out a press release that Lydia was the new uh, <laughs> and emphasized that she